Hello and welcome to Duels of the Mind. I'm joined by former editor of the Daily Dispatch in South Africa, long-time chess enthusiast Donald Woods. We're up to game eight in a chronological look at my choice of the 12 best games. And in a moment, Donald and I will be analysing the game in detail. It's Copenhagen in 1923. Denmark has been overtaken by celebrations of the Royal Silver Wedding. Amongst those present, one of Denmark's most famous adopted sons. Aron Nimzovic had emigrated to Denmark from Riga in Latvia. And in a Grandmaster tournament in Copenhagen, he faced the German Fritz Zamisch in what became known as the Immortal Zugzwang Game. The German word Zugzwang means compulsion to move. And in an amazing sequence, we shall see that a position is forced where literally every move leads to disaster. But first, let's have a look at the players. Playing white, Zamish, who had the unwelcome distinction of losing more games on time than any other master. In 1969, in Linkerping, he lost all 13 of his games in this fashion. Paradoxically, he played speed chess well, and in his 61st year, won two lightning tournaments. Zamish's team members, noting that the Grand Master was addicted to tobacco, sought to eliminate his fatally long periods of thinking by stealing his pipe at regular intervals, only returning it when he had made his move. And this is our first look at the man who many consider to be the greatest player never to win the world title. Aaron Nimzovic was at the height of his career in the mid-1920s and early 30s, but he was consistently denied the opportunity by Capablanca and Alekin. In retaliation, he pompously adopted for himself the title the Crown Prince of the Chess World. At the age of eight, Nimzovic was taught by his father. He later recorded in a brief autobiography how his father had demonstrated to me Anderson's immortal game, which had a profound effect. I not only understood it, but at once fell passionately in love with it. It was not until 1904, while studying mathematics in Germany, that Nimzovic began to concentrate on chess play. His most notable success came after the mid-1920s, when he won at Marienbad in 1925 with Rubinstein and took outright victory at Dresden and Hanover in 1926. A brilliant first place at Karlsbad in 1929 was achieved ahead of Capablanca, Erva and Bogolyubov. His greatest contribution was to chess literature and theory. He is remembered as the author of this book, My System, perhaps the most influential chess book ever written, published in 1925, and as the pioneer of the Nimzo Indian defense. The success of Nimzovich's theories can be gauged from his spectacular tournament results, and the fact that since the 1920s, My System has retained its appeal as the essential book on chess strategy. Nimzovich's theories were a direct challenge to those of Dr. Siegbert Tarasch, leader of the classical school. The differences between the two men were more than theoretical. Nimzovich described his adversary as my born enemy and declared, Tarasch to me always meant mediocrity. Nimzovich will also be remembered for the psychological concept of heroic defense, the deliberate choice of complex positions which would drag the opponent into a maelstrom where draws would be unlikely. This conscious appeal to raw struggle must have been anathema to Tarash. Ill health caused a sudden decline in Nimzovich's form in the 1930s. He was taken fatally sick at the end of 1934 and died of pneumonia after a lingering illness of three months duration at the age of 48. Donald, you've already confessed to being a devoted King's Indian player. Do you study Nimzovich's strategies and theories? Not much, Ray. Um, actually, most <coughs> of my study in the King's Indian was conducted with reference to a book by a chap called Keane. Uh -huh. Take it, you're familiar with it. <laughs> yes, I know it well. That was, in fact, I think one of the very first books I published, a book on the King's Indian. Yeah. Nice, fat volume. And that's it. Yeah. The game we're going to see, Fritz Zamisch is playing white, Nimzovich is black, and we become very used to this move now, d4, and Nimzovich plays this move, and this is the, the key response in the so-called Indian defences. 
what black is doing, as we'll soon see, is he's refraining from occupying the center with his pawns. He's trying to control the center from the edge of the board. White Fianchette is the bishop. That does the same. Well, I always like that analogy about the uncoiling of the spring. With the Fianchetta, yes. yes. And this opening now, Donald, is absolutely standard. But in the early 1920s, it caused all sorts of controversies. Now, I've mentioned already the, the battle between Nimzovich and Tarash. And these people actually had schools of thought. They were like uh, you know, artists or scientists who were bitterly opposed to each other. Academics, perhaps, is the best, the best analogy. And the Tarash school of thought, the classical school of thought, held that you had to take over the control of the center of the board with your pawns. You brought your pieces out quickly, you took control of the center, and then you started the battle. And Nimzovich, on the other hand, founded what's called the hypermodern school of thought. And he said, no, 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 you don't occupy the center with the pawns, you control it long range with the pieces. So we see that this bishop on b7 fits in exactly with that strategy, this interpretation of how the opening should be played. This may startle you, but uh, what occurs to me is a cricket analogy. David Gar is the Nimzovich, and uh, someone like Chris Tavare is Tarash. Mm -hmm. You know, the one is inspirational and uh, very aggressive, mm -hmm. and the other one uh, a bit of a stodge, because Tarash was a bit stodgy. Yes, he? he was very dogmatic. I mean, he used to um, you know, declare quite openly and publicly, you know, this move is wrong. <laughs> and to someone like Nimzovich, the whole idea that a move in an early stage could be wrong, actually wrong, yeah. was... Uh, unimaginative. Yes. Unimaginative. Um, you know, Tar Tarash was really an, the high priest of dogma in chess. And in this game, Nimzovich is trying to... is really establishing his theory that the, that, that the, the center of the board is important, but that the control of it is important more than the occupation. And it continued like this. White brings out the bishop. And Nimzovich also develops his king's bishop. And Zamish plays good classical moves. I mean, the only slight glitch from a classical point of view is that Zamish has developed the bishop on the edge, the, the king's bishop on g2. I and mean, Tarish wouldn't have been absolutely in yeah. favour of this. But apart from that, the pawns are in the middle, the knights are on good central squares, and Zamish is playing the way that Tarish would have approved of. And of course, Zamish was a German, he would have been brought up on Tarish's books. And Nimzovich disliked him. He disliked uh, Zamish or, or Tarash. Uh, Tarash. Nimzovich hated yes. Tarash. In fact, uh, I knew a relative of Nimzovich, and uh, something must have stuck in the family about this mm -hmm. prejudice, because he used to refer to the Tarash defence as the trash defence. <laughs> this, was, this, was, this was a cousin of Nimzovich's? Well. Yes, a uh, cousin or nephew, mm -hmm. Leon Wilkin, in Leon South Wilkin. Africa. Mm -hmm. well, he was playing in the, uh, in the East London club. He was a very fine player. Mm -hmm. he, all he remembers of the great man is uh, sitting on his lap when he was a child. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But well, Nimzovich didn't show him the immortal game when he was falling. No, uh, he did. <laughs> Zamish Castle. And now Nimzovich actually makes a small concession to his great enemy, Tarash. You'd expect from someone who was uh, intent on controlling the centre with his pieces rather than his pawns that he would play a move like this, which is in fact the standard modern move just taking over the e4 square, which White's neglected to, uh, to seize. But he didn't. Um, he actually played d5, putting a pawn in the centre. And I'm sure that after the game, Nimzovich's friends and allies in the hypermodern school ribbed him a bit about this and said, well, you know, you're playing a bit like Tarash anyway. Perhaps the old man had something to say for his theories. Um, Zemich played a very good response. He put his knight here. And this is, this is really an excellent move. I mean, the knight, first of all, takes up a very strong central position. And secondly, he uncovers the force of the white bishop on g2 and puts pressure against the d5 square. And um, black is really now forced to play a rather defensive move. He plays the move c6, which is to reinforce the pawn on d5. And what Zamish does now is plausible, but it's not the best. I mean, there are possibilities to play perhaps a move like this and develop the bishop here, which is certainly a very reasonable strategy. 
But the most vigorous move in this position is to play in good old Tarash style and lash out in the centre. Down the middle. Down the middle. And um, this, in fact, according to modern understanding of the, of the Queen's Indian defence, which is what we're now in, uh, gives White an excellent position, a truly excellent position. But he didn't do that. He made the first mistake in the game. He released the tension. He took off the pawn in the middle. A plausible move, but not the best. Because after Black's reply, C takes D5. The bishop on B7 is now less blocked in than it was before. And the fact that the pawn structure has become symmetrical reduces Black's problems. But Zamish was playing what in his according to his interpretation, were good, natural, solid, developing moves. And now he just brought out the bishop. Nothing wrong with that. And Mimsovich made a little safety pawn move on the edge, perhaps preparing in the future to play this move. But of course, you know, it's hard to see the... Or simply to inhibit that knight. Yes, to stop the knight going to b5. It's hard to see now that black can develop real aggression from this position. Mike plays this move putting the rook on the open file, good classical stuff. Rooks belong in open files. And now Nimzovich shows the first signs of counter-attack. He gains a little bit of space on the queen side. And I think that perhaps the way to deal with this would have been for Zamish immediately to play a move like this, challenging that yeah. black pawn and really trying to exploit the fact that white's pieces are better developed. But he played another very natural queen move. And one idea behind this is to put the knight from c3 to a4. And of course that can't be taken because the queen on b3 yeah. would capture the black bishop on b7. So that's a quite serious threat in the position. Now, if you look at this position, Donald, who would you say was better? Well, um, to me, I mean, I can't see that, that um, Zemish has landed himself in any trouble yet. No, not at uh, all. He may not have played the best, but his position no, but was fully viable. Pretty, yeah, pretty sound. And what, what, what I, one of the things I find so fascinating about this game is that White's play is completely sensible. He develops his pieces, he castles, he brings everything out. In fact, he has a lead in development now. And you can't actually fault any, anything specific. No. And it's amazing that a position that's been so well developed um, can, as we shall soon see, be reduced to rubble. Within one little move or two. I mean, we're, we're now almost halfway through the yeah. game. And apart from the pawn structure being symmetrical, and white having the better development, the better mobilisation, um, you know, it looks as if white's the one who's aggressing. I mean, there are the bishop on f4, the rook on c1, all of these are aiming on the c-file, perhaps the c7 point can become weak. It really looks like a fine position for white. But within a few moves, everything changes round in a remarkable way. Now, let me ask you a question on behalf of the great a mass of club players. Mm -hmm. um, does Nimzovich know this at this stage? No, I think that at the moment Nimzovich is thinking about trying to get an equal position. Mm -hmm. He's not thinking of some grand, right. devastating strategy that's going to wind up. So he doesn't player. know that within a very short time uh, this chap's walking into a, a clobbering event. No, I think at this point oh. Nimzovich is quite nervous actually. Okay. I think he's. Well, that's just reassuring. Yes. <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, the, the attack develops soon, but at the moment I think Nimzovich is, is really concerned with equalising the position and getting a, getting a playable game. And he kicks off by at last bringing out the knight. And the threat now is to do to white what white was threatening to do to Castle black. the queen. Yes, yeah. is to come here, attacking the queen, and then sink the knight into this square at some point. And this would be really annoying. It would render nugatory all white's attempts to dominate in the sea farm. So let's put the knight back where it belongs. And in order to stop that, Nuzovic called this the ghost of an outpost in the sea file. He said the knight was like a spectre, a phantom, a ghost treading carefully towards the sea four square. And white was bothered about this, and he eliminated the ghost. He took it off. Knight takes c6. And Nuzovic took back, of course, bishop takes c6. And suddenly, at a stroke, the position's been transformed. I wouldn't say black was better yet. I think far from it. But suddenly, black's eliminated the powerful knight on e5. He's actually more or less completed his own development. And the fact that he has this pawn duo on a6 and b5 
means that he has the chance to launch aggressive tactics on the Queen's Wing. And what starts to happen now is that Zamish can't form a strategy. There's a kind of deadlock in the middle of the board, and Zamish is unable to find sensible moves that improve his position. All he can do is wait. And what this reminds me of in a strange way, and I've talked about in the introduction the fact that the hypermodern masters after the First World War were somehow influenced by the irrationality of the war. They were also, chess is a war game, they were impressed by the, the way the war was fought, the blockades, the, you know, the tremendous trench warfare, these great pitch battles. And what I see the rest of this game as is a, is a kind of chessboard reflection of First World War battle tactics. Trench lines being drawn up, long-term attrition, attrition, strangulation. And Zamish starts the attrition from his point of view with this pawn move H3, which is really a nothing move. It doesn't alter the position very much. I take it we'll be going nuclear later in the... Nuclear <laughs> later on, yes, that's right. And Nimzovich improves his position. He brings up the queen. And now one of his ideas is to push this pawn on to here, driving away the knight, and then later to put the bishop on the A4 square when the knight's moved, really harassing the white queen. So Zamish has to face this possibility in the future. And for example, were he to put a rook on d1, which is quite sensible, then that maneuver would be absolutely devastating, and it would win the rook on d1 yes. in due course. So Zamish continues with this waiting strategy, building his trench. He's building his trench for the future. And this is where the game becomes transformed. And so far it's been a game of slow maneuver. And now suddenly, Nimzovich clicks. He sees the chance for a real attack. And as Anakin did last week, this attack isn't just on one side of the board. It embraces the whole spectrum of possibilities. And he starts off with this move, attacking the bishop. And we've seen in earlier games in this series how incautiously letting a bishop be captured by a knight in the early stage can lead to disaster. And by the 1920s, they all knew about this. And of course, Zamish moves away as bishop. And now the attack continues. Nimzovich pushes on his f-pawn. And what he's stopping White from doing is playing this liberating move, pawn yes. to e4. He's really clamping down on that. And he's also, in the future, perhaps threatening to play something like this, coming to grips with the White King. Zamish was now tired of these threats against the Queen over here, this, this idea of, of b4. And he brought his Queen back to d1. And there's an, another cunning idea behind that. He's trying to play this move, pawn to e4. Threaten the knight. And the queen on d1, as you so rightly said, threatens the knight on h5. This would liberate the white position. But at the moment he can't do that because Nimzovich is still pressing. And now on comes the queenside pawn, attacking the knight. It's only got one square. And already a transformation has come over this position. Three or four moves ago, white had a perfect development. Everything was up. And now the queen's had to come back. It's getting the pretty back. crowded back there. <laughs> the bishops come back. Everything's been driven back. And we can see very much in what's happening now the germ of this blockade idea that I identify. You, know, that you have the trench lines drawn up, and then you start to strangle the opponent. You know, your trench starts to get closer. You start to encroach around the edges. And eventually the opponent dies of lack of space, a lack of logistics, lack of food, lack of water, lack of everything. And they have to surrender. And this becomes even more marked as we go along. The bishop comes here, tightening the noose. And now the move e2 to it's e4 out. Out. is out it's because this. the rook's attacked. So Zamish is forced to make another rather humiliating retreat, the rook on g1. And up comes the bishop. Now aiming bishop and knight, knight on h5, bishop on d6, against the pawn on g3 in the general direction of the king. It's like seeing those sheepdog trials where things start getting herded to. <laughs> That's right. And now, at last, Zamish plays his trump card. He plays e2 to e4. And this can be taken by the black pawns, of course. But the point is that the white queen on d1 attacks the black knight on h5. And were black to defend it with a move like this, then white could play e5. And suddenly he's back in the game again. He's gained space. You know, his trench has encroached on the other guy's trench. He will have gained the terrain. And all the problems are over. But it's at this point that Nimzovich comes up with this fantastic conception. 
which really shows the blockade idea in its purest and most devastating form. He takes off like this, giving up the knight. The queen takes the knight, and rook takes the pawn. Now this looks at first just like a harm, a standard sacrifice. It's getting two pawns for a piece, not a, not a bad deal. But it's deeper than that. There's more to it. The bishop on d2 is under some pressure. And Zamish puts his queen on g5 to defend the bishop, and also to bring the queen back at some point to the e3 square for defence. Right. Um, why would he not, Zamish, try and budge that rook? before he does anything else. He doesn't want to, he can't really attack the rook if he moves the bishop away, yeah. then the pawn on b2 is yeah, going right, as well. Right, yes. Overcomes this rook, increasing the pressure, and Zemish plays this to unpin his bishop, at least the bishop yeah. can move. Up comes the rook, attacking the queen. It's almost got no squares, but it can retreat to here. Queen to e3. In comes the bishop, Ah, uh, locking it up. Yes. Drawing the noose even tighter. Yes. And the threat now is this. Yes. Winning the white queen. So he stops it with this move. Rook to e1. And now, on move 25, so early in the game, this is a miniature game, according to the rules, 25 moves is a miniature game, h6. And in this position, Zamish resigned. White has been bound hand and foot. This is the immortal Zugzwang position. On a crowded board, full of pieces, White doesn't have a decent move left. Never it's, was a Zug or Zwang. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable. And this is the apotheosis yeah. of First World War yeah. battlefield tactics shown on the chessboard. It's quite incredible. What can White do? He can't move this rook on G1 to here, for example. A single thing. It can be taken. If he moves the rook on E1 away, for example, back to c1, and the rook goes to e2, and the queen is lost. He can't move the bishop on d2. If it goes here to c1, the bishop on d3 takes the knight yes. on b1. It's and a if, bow constrictor. Yeah, and if he yes. plays the king to h2, then the rook comes into here, winning the queen, because now the bishop is pinned against the king. It is a nightmare situation. I think of all the games you've gone through, Ray, this is the one I'd hate most to be on the losing Yes, game. because you gain negative Scandia. immortality. Yes. <laughs> all White can do, for example, is he can play a move like this, for example. He can wait. And then Black simply moves his king. Yeah. And eventually White runs out of moves. Yeah. And, he, and, he, and uh, then he has to ha suffer massive material deficits. And this is... What a feat of the imagination this is. And it, it's... It's think, in many ways the most extraordinary of all these yes, games. Yes, of, yeah. of, of closing positions... In this entire series, this is the most extraordinary, you're quite right. I, I think if somebody was set the task of inventing a closing position that was you know, the most extraordinary finish to a chess game, they couldn't do better than this. The most frustrating. Yes, and this was created in the heat of battle in a tournament in Copenhagen. Anyway, Donald, thanks very much for your contribution to the program. In our next program, we look at the second real theoretician to emerge from the growing ranks of chess professionals in the 20th century. By the Second World War, the Minzo Indian was universally accepted, and one of its greatest exponents was the Russian Mikhail Botvinnik. He features in a superb 1938 game, which Donald and I will be looking at next week. Join us then for another duel of the mind. For now, from Thames's chess team, it's good night. <laughs>